I am Tiara Webb, Marketing and Engagement Officer for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Bermuda. Our next panel is Financial Services and Data Protection and will be moderated by Ms. Vivian Arts. The panel will explore how the privacy information requirements of financial services can be successfully integrated with privacy and data protection responsibilities. Without further ado, Ms. Arts, please begin when you're ready. Terrific. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for rushing back after lunch. I know that everyone else is going to come pouring in <laughs> in a minute because they, too, cannot wait to hear about financial services um, and privacy. So um, thank you. Um, this is a very important topic, uh, not just for um, individuals globally, but specifically for Bermuda. Um, because a huge part of the Bermudan economy is driven by financial services, uh, particularly the insurance sector. So it's an absolute privilege and a pleasure uh, to be here today to have the opportunity to moderate this panel, um, which I have put together uh, together with Jem Davies, um, who is Bermudan herself and is um, the head of compliance and the data protection officer for the UK Bank of England. Um, but she won't be with us in person, unfortunately, but we are going to hear from her nonetheless. So to start today, I'd like to just turn to each of my panelists and say thank you very much for coming a long way to be with us. Some have come a long way and some have come from just down the road. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And then I will um, do an introduction to uh, our topic today, and then we'll start on our discussion. So can I start with you, Alessandra? Sure. Let me, first of all, warmly thank the organizers for this uh, outstanding conference in this beautiful place. Uh, my name is Alessandra Pierucci, and I work for the Italian Data Protection Authority, the Garante, in particular the service for EU and international matters. And among the different activities that we carry out in that service, uh, I had the privilege to follow the, the work of the Consultative Committee of Convention 108, uh, uh, which uh, I had the honor to chair for six years until last year and um, also to coordinate uh, at the European Data Protection Board level um, the working group on financial matters, which, as you can imagine, deals with data protection uh, in the financial sector. Thank you. I'm Laurie Baker. I work for the Commissioner of Data Protection for the Dubai International Financial Center. Um, I, before I was in Dubai, I've worked with um, Dun & Bradstreet, British Telecom, France Telecom in Europe, in, in London, and uh, prior to that uh, for British Telecom in New York, uh, when we're spending a lot of time doing a lot of work in this space, so I'm really looking forward to this panel, and thank you to Vivian and to the organizers for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Fiella. I'm the VP Head of Legal and Corporate Services at Clarion Bank, uh, one of the local financial institutions here in Bermuda. Uh, Part of my role is serving as data protection officer for the organization, and uh, I've been heavily involved in their uh, digital transformation journey, as well as developing their privacy program, uh, and we're very much looking forward to uh, PIPA's implementation at the beginning of 2025, so that's a little bit about me. Great. Thank you, and thank you, Vivian, and the organizers for this, um, this event and this panel. I'm honored to be with my colleagues here. Um, my name is Tammy Dawkin. I most recently completed a four-year appointment at the World Bank, um, where I was the first chief data privacy officer and stood up its first uh, data privacy program and data privacy office. Um, prior to that, I was chief privacy officer and data protection officer at MoneyGram an international um, financial services company, and prior to that, with a hospitality company that was global, and then um, uh, got my wheels as a corporate transactional lawyer. Good afternoon. I am Karamako Dickens. I'm Bermudian. Welcome, everyone, to our wonderful island. I am CEO and co-founder of Conci, which is a local Bermuda consulting company that specializes in technology as well as legislative matters. 
Prior to becoming an entrepreneur, I worked in the public and private sector, focusing in on digital identity, increasing efficiencies through digitization, as well as making sure that the companies I worked for were in compliance with regulations. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about the intersection of financial services and privacy. And in fact, there's a lot of complementarity between financial services and privacy. Financial services is regarded as one of those sectors where customers are more likely to trust a financial institution with their data than any other institution. Um, which is terrific. And a lot of that goes to the history of financial services. Financial services, uh, of course, is governed by banking secrecy rules, which vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Financial services understands the importance of confidentiality between the customer relationship and the financial institution. And of course, we have data protection laws as well, which govern the um, confidentiality and the data rights between an individual and the data controller that processes their information. So it forms a very nice Venn diagram, in a sense, between banking secrecy, confidentiality, and then data protection. We also know that the financial services sector is one of the most innovative and one of the most highly digitized sectors in the world. And it operates on a global basis. <clears throat> so financial services needs to deal with personal data, but also personal data transfers. And the confidentiality of that information is so fundamental to um, individual trust as well. And financial services, of course, has also been an early adopter of artificial intelligence or machine learning. I prefer machine learning because it's not that intuitive. Um, but we've been using AI for over 20 years um, as we've digitized the financial services sector. And so very often it feels more like ones and zeros uh, crossing the geographical boundaries rather than um, banknotes and coins, as the case may be. Um, but what we're seeing is a tremendous innovation and evolution within um, financial services as we look to digital assets and as we look to central bank digital currencies. So financial services continues to innovate and is becoming much more innovative and digital in this space at a rate of knots. Um, and we're seeing that assets are tokenized. And this isn't just in the future. This is very much now. So the first topic which we're going to touch on today is around digital assets and central bank digital currencies and look at some of the privacy issues between the two. But a lot of the focus on this panel is going to be looking at how the financial services um, sector operates in relation to its relationship with customers, um, its innovation, CBDCs, but also financial crime. And we're going to hear from both practitioners and regulators around how we're seeing cooperation and collaboration so that privacy can be an enabler for better financial services um, rather than there be a tension between the two. Um, because the financial services regulation, of course, has grown up um, in, a, in a specific space, and the privacy legislation has grown up beside it. And what we're seeing now, hopefully, is a lot more crossover between the two. So I'm going to just start with um, CBDCs and digital assets. So earlier this year, the Center for Information Policy Leadership published a paper on what are digital assets and the intersection with privacy. The paper is freely available from the CIPL website, so please feel free to go and download it. Um, we did a lot of work with both our members and experts and regulators reading their papers and engaging with them to better understand the issues and the intersections and also to make some recommendations around how we can regulate in future in an innovative way in order to address some of the challenges that um, digital assets pose for us. So this is a, um, a visualization of some of the tensions between blockchain, because digital assets effectively rely on blockchain and some of the data protection principles. So we have the applicability of law and definitions on the privacy side. We have concepts of controllers and processors, for example. But the technology and the way in which blockchain operates doesn't necessarily meet with those traditional concepts um, in data protection. 
because what we're seeing is lots and lots of players, each playing an individual role, not necessarily connected, and no obvious controller or processor. And part of the reason why we have those concepts of controller and processor is also about allocating accountability and responsibility. And so there's a real challenge in the blockchain environment around how do we allocate responsibility for data protection in what is effectively a highly distributed and decentralized model. As I said, accountability. Accountability is that ownership of responsibility. And in a blockchain which is by design a decentralized system where data is not processed centrally or controlled centrally, it gives rise to some real challenges on how do we apply that concept of accountability in that distributed environment. On the privacy side, we're very familiar with the concept of data minimization. But the reality of blockchain is that it is often an append-only and ever-growing network that augments and adds further data in each block. So the blockchain actually duplicates and produces more data as it goes along. Um, and so again, quite challenging to see how we reconcile that with data minimization. In terms of purpose limitation, really important concept on the privacy side, we find that further processing of data as it's placed on the blockchain may not be compatible with the original purpose. And it can be quite difficult, despite smart contracts, to limit the further and other use of data as it goes down the blockchain and is created and appended by others. On data security, we've seen a lot of scandals in relation to data security on some of the platforms out there that have been leveraging blockchain, often because there's no consensus and standardization around the techniques to achieve the right level or the desired level of data security. I personally think that's one of the areas that is going to be much easier to address if we can achieve a level of, of standardization with regard to uh, data security, but we're not there yet. Confidentiality and government access to data has been an area that we have discussed as well. Um, and the, the issue there really is that because of the transparency of blockchain, anyone, including governments, can see transactions in a more transparent way than ever before. So it's one thing to have data in an analog sense. Um, it takes time and effort in order to be able to view and review the data. But in the blockchain, it is just so much more transparent and immediately digestible, giving insights perhaps that were not possible before in an economic or timely way. How do we reconcile individual rights in a blockchain when transactions are recorded forever um, and there is no possibility to delete? I mean, that is one of the features of blockchain um, is that fantastic ability to audit because you can see all the transactions all the way down the line. And if there's no single authority to deal with individual rights requests, to whom does that responsibility fall? And then, of course, we have the cross-border data transfer and enforcement issues. So again, like much of financial services more generally, blockchain is international by default. It is borderless by default. Um, and it is, although you might find a legal entity based in a particular jurisdiction, so much of what happens in practice is taking place anywhere within the globe. And so that gives some rise to some interesting questions around responsibility there. So that's just a quick overview of some of the areas that are going to need our creative and innovative thoughts so that we can achieve an outcome-based um, result that meets the expectations of privacy. But given the nature of the technology, I think we're going to have to be a little bit more creative about how we get there, given the current concepts that we have um, in data protection legislation. So enough from me on the blockchain, and I'm going to hand over now to Jem Davies, who's joining us um, virtually, to talk about central bank digital currencies and the recent work that the Bank of England and His Majesty's Treasury have been doing on their consultation in this space with a specific focus on privacy. Over to Jem. Welcome all on this Monday, the 16th of October, 2023. Although I cannot be there in person, I am delighted to have the privilege of kickstarting the discussion on central banking, digital currencies, and privacy considerations. I thought it would be quite useful to set some context um, on the work that's being done by the bank. So 
The bank and HMT published a consultation paper on the digital pound in February 2023. This paper set out the current and potential future trends in money and payments, why those trends point to a likely need for a digital pound in the future, and invited comments on a proposed model. We've received over 50,000 responses to that consultation and are working through those responses now with the aim of publishing a document discussing them before the end of this year. We have not yet decided on whether to issue the digital pound, but judge that it is likely to be needed. The earliest point at which the digital pound could be launched would be the second half of the decade. Some key features of the digital pound. So the digital pound would be an electronic form of central bank money available to consumers. Like cash, it would be issued by the central bank, i.e. the Bank of England, but unlike cash, it would be digital. We also want central bank money, which is only currently available to the public as cash, to remain useful and accessible in order to anchor confidence and stability in our monetary system. We also want to support innovation in our domestic payment system as more payments become digital. The digital pound would be provided via a public-private partnership named the platform model. Here, the Bank of England would issue the digital pound and then build and run the core digital pound infrastructure, the core ledger. Private sector firms, known as payment interface providers or PIPs, would then be able to integrate into the central digital in the form of wallets, but they would never be in possession of customer funds. So with that context and background in mind, I thought it would be helpful to just outline some headline narratives on privacy. So our view is that the digital pound would be at least as private as commercial bank accounts today. Ensuring that public trust in money remains high is fundamental to our work on the digital pound. Work on data and privacy issues has been led, led on by both the Bank of England and HMT. A digital pound would be private, but not anonymous. Anonymity is not appropriate because the ability to identify and verify users is necessary to prevent financial crime. So, as with cards and bank accounts today, the digital pound would be privacy protected, but not anonymous some basic user identification would be required. Private sector firms would know their customers in order to be able to open a digital pound wallet. They would store and process users' data for anti-fraud and financial crime purposes, and as part of establishing and maintaining their commercial relationships with their users. To be clear, neither the bank nor the government would have access to digital pound users' personal data PIPs would anonymize personal data before any sharing with the bank so that there would be no personally identifiable information available on our side. It is crucial that, from the bank's perspective, this data would be anonymized and that the bank would not know the identity of the payer or the payee. As with bank accounts today, law enforcement agencies may need to access digital pound data under limited circumstances prescribed in law and on the same basis as applies to other digital payments today. So why does the platform model matter for privacy? On this model, end users would interact with PIPs rather than directly with the bank. They could use it to see their balance and instruct payments and transfers of digital pounds. As a result, PIPs would also bear the legal responsibility to conduct any necessary know your customer and anti laundering and excuse me anti money laundering checks these would not be performed by the bank as we will not use we will not view users personal data so some reasons why we believe that the digital pound the digital pound cannot be anonymous like cash cash as a physical form of money has lower amounts of personal data collection than other forms However, 
the UK AML and CFT regime dictates that additional information about the payer must be collected for large value transactions made in cash. The digital pound would have lower frictions than physical cash, so carries higher risks of abetting crime. Additionally, international standards implemented by the Financial Action Task Force inhibit financial institutions from keeping anonymous accounts. In keeping with these standards, we've decided that it is not appropriate to allow anonymity for digital pounds. However, like cash, we are exploring ways to allow low values of digital pounds to be spent with lower personal data collection requirements. This could be achieved in a way that is compliant with anti-money laundering and CFT regulation through a tiered privacy system. We have also partnered with MIT Media Lab's digital company uh, to explore technological challenges, trade-offs and risks in designing a central bank digital currency. This includes exploring privacy enhancing technologies. So to wrap up, the Bank of England and HMT are now in the design phase, which allows us to plan out exactly how we want the digital pound to be designed. Data and privacy will be a crucial area of focus in this phase of work, including through our collaboration with the private sector. Experimentation and exploration of different technology proposals are helping us to better understand how to design a system that ensures the highest standards of user privacy. Many thanks. Terrific. Thank you so much, Jim, for that overview. Um, a few takeaways. 50,000 responses just shows the level of business and individual engagement in the prospect of digital money. Uh, I know my, one of my responses is definitely in there. Um, and I like the, the reference that the digital pound is going to be very similar to current accounts of today. Not anonymous, but confidential. Um, and in order to reduce the um, friction, um, they're going to align the privacy in a tiered way. So it was, it was terrific to see so much of the privacy being reflected um, in, the, in the consultation there. But while the UK is looking at the digital pound, and there's many other jurisdictions that are looking at digital currencies, the EU has also unveiled plans for a digital euro across the euro uh, member states to be launched potentially as soon as 2027. So Alessandra, can you share with us the proposed privacy approach by the European Central Bank and the challenging issues raised by the introduction of a digital currency in the EU? Yes, sure. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, indeed, the European Commission in, uh, in June uh, 2023, two years after the, the launch of a preliminary investigation phase on the digital euro, uh, published uh, a proposal for a legislative framework uh, uh, on a possible digital euro. Um, this important step, of course, has been taken in a worldwide scenario where there is a growing interest uh, towards uh, central bank digital currencies, as uh, we also see from the previous uh, speaker. Um, just to give you some figures, uh, recent surveys uh, have, shown, has, have shown that uh, uh, currently almost 130 countries are engaging in the preparation of a possible digital currency, which is even, uh, let's say, more significant uh, if compared to 2020, when those countries were only 35. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are remarkable public reasons for the introduction of a central bank digital currency, which can vary a little bit from country to country. And uh, in respect of the European Union, as it has been uh, said and made explicit by the European uh, Central Bank, are very much linked, first of all, to the need to respond to an increasing demand for more secure and trusted payments, um, but also to provide an anchor of stability to the monetary systems, and also to strengthen the, uh, let's say, uh, monetary sovereignty in the euro area, so uh, facilitating competition and efficiency of the European payment sector, um, which, as you know, I mean, in terms of mm, digital payment sector, has been dominated largely by private actors. 
So there are important public interests uh, on the one hand, but also privacy risks, uh, as uh, we have just heard. Uh, just to give you some hints, uh, uh, first of all, um, central bank digital currencies may provide uh, central banks uh, to, let's say, uh, with unprecedented access uh, to their citizens' financial data, therefore posing significant risks uh, to privacy. Um, let's say that uh, inappropriate design choices may increase considerably privacy risks, and then we have to consider that the transaction data uh, can reveal very sensitive aspect uh, of a person. Just to give you an example, transaction data could be unlawfully used for credit evaluation or for cross-selling initiatives. And then, of course, we have also the, the security risks, which are relevant as well, as in respect of CBDC um, infrastructure, let's say that the security requirements and expectations are very high and may therefore turn into a significant loss of trust from, from users. So in this, uh, in this scenario at uh, the European Union level, the European Data Protection Board, which as you know encompasses the European Union Data Protection Authorities, but also the EDPS, which uh, is playing a crucial role in the field, um, engaged in a big effort, including the launch of a dialogue with the European Central Bank, also European Union legislators, uh, from, to, to ensure that from a very early stage of the construction of the digital euro, uh, data protection concerns uh, were, were duly considered. And uh, right after the announcement of the launch of the digital euro at European Union level, the EDPB, for example, adopted a letter to European institutions in June 2021, which was then followed by a contribution to the public consultation launched by the European Commission in, this, in the, the, the year after, actually, and then uh, published a further statement uh, in October 22, um, this time in particular focused uh, on the design choices uh, of, the, of the digital euro. And these are all publicly available documents. Um, we can say that in the position expressed by the DPV so far, there are some crucial messages that we can distinguish. Um, I will start from some political messages, broadly speaking, of course. Uh, first of all, that a very high standard of privacy um, is crucial to reinforce the trust of users and must become a distinctive element in the offering of the digital euro, uh, representing a sort of key factor of the success of, of this project. And this idea, I would say that it was very much strengthened by the fact that the majority of the respondents to a public consultation raised by the, launched by the European Commission in 2021, basically highlighted that their major concern was privacy and that they wanted a, a digital euro uh, which was respectful for privacy and which can be used offline. Uh, what is relevant is that this result could be observed throughout the European Union and in all the categories of respondents, so citizens, payment industry, NGOs, <coughs> academics. Um, another, let's say, again, broadly speaking message given by the political message given by the DPB is that uh, digital euro will have uh, the legal uh, tender status uh, in the European Union at the time of its issuance, uh, which means in regular terms that it will be assimilated to bank notes. Uh, and that's the message from DPB that uh, from a data protection point of view, the digital euro should be uh, as much as possible closer to physical cash, which must become a sort of relevant benchmark to strike a balance between the different in interests at stake. For example, by considering thresholds, uh, we heard about it before, below which transactions uh, should not be monitored in the AML CFT context, uh, as is the case for the physical world. Um, moreover, the ADPB has highlighted that a modality offering offline transactions uh, anonymously or in the lack of, of it at least uh, with a high level of pseudonymization is necessary to mitigate the risks uh, for rights and freedoms of data um, of subjects. And this is a choice which has been mirrored by the European Commission in its proposal 
uh, considering that Article 23 explicitly says that digital euro shall be available for both online and offline digital euro payment uh, transaction. I don't know if I can go on for another minute, so you just stop me if I'm too long. <laughs> I just wanted to add that there are also some, let's say, methodology messages that have been given by the ADPB, which I think are very relevant. The data protection should not be a, a purely compliance exercise, but it must really become um, in the core decision on the establishment of a digital currency, and that appropriate legislative measures should accompany the the issuance of a digital currency because let's say that legislative tools, if of course well conceived, can represent a precious instrument to provide legal certainty in respect of the data process in compliance with the minimization principle and also to be able to clearly demonstrate the necessity and the proportionality of the data which are processed in this context. Finally, of course, the DPB gave also some technical messages. I don't think we have the time to go into the details here, but just let me recall uh, uh, the need to prefer schemes uh, where data are tokenized in order to avoid the central monitoring of, uh, of transaction and, for example, uh, store tokens locally uh, on end user devices. Mm, just a final word, I promise, um, on the fact that, of course, uh, the experience at the European Union level of interaction between data protection authorities and the EU financial institutions was, I would say, positive. Uh, for example, the, the path towards a legislative uh, approach establishing the, the digital currencies which had been recommended by the DPB has been followed, which has, is a very good thing. Of course, it is a legislative process which is uh, susceptible of ameliorations, and uh, this will be exactly the object of uh, an opinion um, uh, elaborated jointly by the DPB and the DPS that will be discussed tomorrow at the ADPB uh, plenary, and uh, on which, of course, I cannot anticipate mm -hmm. anything, but uh, I will be happy to discuss about it in the next uh, few days. Thank you. Super. So we're going to watch the space tomorrow for some interesting news there. And thank you very much for just talking a little bit about the centrality of privacy in the whole discussion around the digital euro, and that is so important uh, to trust. Laurie, can I come to you next? Because um, you obviously work with the DIFC, and that is a unique model, um, and it's, it's an independent free zone for financial services, but you've demonstrated a close working relationship between financial services and the privacy regulator, particularly in relation to blockchain um, uh, developments and the increasing shift to digital financial services. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that works in practice? Yeah, absolutely. So just a quick history of DIFC. It's Dubai International Financial Center, and we're a free zone, independent, carved out of the sort of federal level of uh, laws and regulations in the UAE. Uh, we have a sister jurisdiction. They're sitting in the back, Abu Dhabi Global Markets. <laughs> um, yeah, so th these two free zones were set up for the purposes of instituting common law and um, sort of more global practices outside of the whole Sharia law framework. Um, and it's been quite successful. We've been around for almost 20 years mm -hmm. now and have had a privacy law in place since then um, and have done quite a lot of work as well with our other DIFC body, which is the Dubai Financial Services Authority, which is largely modeled on the, um, <clears throat> the FSA, now FCA, in the UK as well. So with that as a backdrop, um, we have kind of moved beyond even financial services and see it largely as a privacy and financial crime prevention model, if you will, under the same compliance umbrella of regulatory compliance. Um, you know, and so we look at monitoring, enforcement, and so on um, on a broader level, and we apply our data protection law to our financial crime prevention requirements and vice versa. So uh, a few of the things, and I was making a few notes as, uh, as we were talking about, um, so we do have financial crime prevention and data protection sitting together under that umbrella. Um, even for non-financial services entities, and we also, as I said, work with the DFSA um, to implement FATF and OECD recommendations around AML 
ESR and economic substance and uh, common reporting standards. So a lot of the privacy issues that underpin that, I've also developed the methodology for the actual implementation of the financial services uh, or financial crime prevention models in the non-financial services side and work closely with the DFSA on the financial services side. Um, in our data protection law, we spent a lot of time, if you go back for a moment, eventually you don't have to right now, but to the slide that was up about things like accountability, transparency, individual rights, and so on, um, when we were revamping our law in 2020, uh, we looked at a lot of things that blockchain sort of prevents um, and a lot of issues that could occur if we didn't have certain controls in place. One of them being um, notices. Uh, we have a very clear requirement in our law that says if you're going to use some sort of uh, advanced technology that like blockchain or, or generative AI or what have you that um, prevents data subjects from exercising certain rights, you need to make that a very clear notice up front and you need to satisfy yourself through a risk assessment that they would actually comprehend and understand that um, impact on their, on their rights. We also have registers uh, throughout our law. Uh, there's a requirement for, for example, other DFC bodies like the DFSA um, to maintain a register of exemptions so that it's transparent and they have a bit of accountability um, built in as well for not simply just saying, well, look, we have financial crime to prevent, so we're going to do whatever we like. We have to maintain this on a register. We have to show where the exemptions have been exercised. And if the commissioner of data protection wishes to inspect that register, they can do so, he can do so. Um, so we, we've modeled that in, and it's, it's really in particular uh, important given the fact that we have such a huge innovation hub. We have an AI and Web3 campus developing, um, and we have a lot of tech companies coming through and, and building really advanced technology that um, some of these issues will hit directly head on around accountability, around notice, around um, you know, regulatory remit of the financial services regulator vis-a-vis -vis the financial services related technology that's being built. Um, another interesting thing uh, that we've done recently, we've implemented or we've, we've just enacted and we're in the process of implementing uh, regulations around, um, we say autonomous and semi-autonomous systems because I agree with you, there's a, sort of a AI um, heavy <laughs> verbiage these days and it's, it's machine learning, any kind of system that um, is a complex model like that that could potentially um, take a life of its own for perhaps for processing personal data. Um, it's about processing personal data in those systems. And what we've incorporated in there are activation of some of the things in our law. It's implementing regulations of the law around certification schemes, unfair and deceptive practices like the FTC. We've built that into our regulations as well. Um, it activates that notices element. We're going to be testing a lot of the methodology around these things out through a data protection accelerator, um, hopefully with cooperation of other regulators in the region. We have Article 28 on government data sharing, which again is one of those things where you, know, you have the central bank or the DFSA or any other regulator from around the world um, asking for personal data for financial crime prevention. We've built in an extra article that I don't think exists otherwise. Um, in other laws that says, if you do that, again, you have to do additional due diligence. You have to do some additional legwork as a controller handing that data over and satisfy yourself of the fact that you've done a necessity and proportionality test, that you've scoped it out properly. Um, obviously, if there's some sort of warrant or court order or something that says you're handing over data, then you're handing over data. But um, to the extent that you can work with that regulator, maybe even getting written assurances is in our law as well. Um, that's something that we've built in to make sure, again, that there's another control and practice on that data sharing. And I'll just mention as well that we also have just recently launched a digital assets consultation, so digital assets law, um, to kind of revise the law of securities scheme in our jurisdiction. So if you want to give feedback on that, please do. The consultation is on the DIFC website. It's DIFC.ae and uh, just reaching out generally to work with other regulators and stay in touch. I mean, that's a control in and of itself and, and quite a practical application of what we're trying to build in the DIFC is 
finding out what others are doing and, and working with the likes of Jersey, for example, Bermuda, Singapore, um, staying involved in the World Alliance of International Financial Centers and, and just comparing notes and making sure that in practice we are doing what we're meant to be doing. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Laurie. I remember when DIFC was started uh, 20 years ago, and I think you have a unique model in that you started with privacy and financial services regulation mm. at the same time. Yeah. And so yours is a unique model of the two growing up together, and you can see that incredible um, co cooperation and collaboration mm. between the two. Whereas I think in many jurisdictions, the experience of financial institutions has been that the financial services regulation has operated in one silo, and the privacy regulation has op operated in a different silo. And even when you use terms like risk-based approach, it means something completely different in financial services than it does in privacy. Um, but the, the regulatory cooperation is such an important element of that. And I'll just put a shout out in here for the UK, um, you know, with the Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum, and there was an MOU signed also between the ICO and the FCA in 2019. What we are seeing is that connection and collaboration between regulators, um, which is super important. So, Laurie, I mean, you're you're a case in point, and the DIFC is is, a, is an excellent example of how it can be done, particularly if you have the opportunity of starting from a blank sheet of paper. But I'm just conscious of time, so mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Jeff to you because you're a DPO and you're also head of regulatory compliance, and you're advising on the digital transition for a Bermudan bank, so going fully digital, and you're breaking new ground on the intersection of um, financial services and privacy requirements. So tell me, how do you address what is often seen as the gap between financial services regulators and their need and their requirement for you to know your customer better, to know more about them, and then data protection regulators who are focused on minimizing the amount of data you collect. So, yeah, and to use it, again, only for specific purposes. On the ground, how are you managing that? And do you have any connection or relationship with your regulators in doing so? Uh, so I would say to that last question, absolutely. Uh, I think there's a, I think we're lucky in Bermuda to have uh, a regulator like the Bermuda Monetary Authority for Financial Services that is, that recognizes that there is a, an overlap and that there are complementary ways that you can approach both sides of the fence. So. Uh, uh, for for the local banks and financial services, uh, there's been a lot of focus recently on conduct of business, which I think is a very helpful um, bridge between the two regimes of sort of prudential um, regulatory oversight, uh, prevention of financial crime, and then also the data privacy uh, overlay that the privacy commissioner brings to uh, to the landscape. And so, what I'm finding. Uh, certainly in my experience, is that it may have been a bit of a journey to get all of those elements out on the table, but they're now out on the table, and we're using the opportunity to kind of, uh, so with Know Our Customer, it's obviously it's expanding more outside of the AML sphere, um, and you're having to look at other things such as certain vulnerabilities and how that can impact uh, the way uh, we're delivering services to our customers. Um, I also think that there's a recognition with the recent publication of a code of conduct for cyber um, risk management um, in the operational arena that uh, also recognizes the importance that data security plays in the overall um, management of privacy rights. And then, of course, there's the intrinsic recognition that personal information itself has a value, not different, not that much different from the cash or the assets that you're obviously holding and managing for your customers and your clients. So certainly from a, one of the challenges is, is, is getting the internal buy-in to recognize the value of um, investing in whether it's technological security solutions or a, a holistic privacy program that's going to you know address all of the uh, operational risks as well as the uh, regulatory and reputational risks involved in managing people's personal information and trying to find ways to harmonize uh, all of those things 
in a way that makes the customer happy. <laughs> so just a quick question. Are you seeing the digital transition as providing you with an opportunity to use technology to bridge some of those divides, or is it creating more challenges in the process? I think with that, any significant change in, in an organization, particularly for you know, financial service institutions, um, there's a little bit of a learning process on the go. That being said, there are certainly, so uh, one of the things that we've worked on over the last few years is improving our digital onboarding process. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we wanted to achieve was somebody was interested in, in opening up an account with our bank, and uh, so we wanted to provide them with an online workflow that allowed them to do just that, while also respecting the various obligations we have uh, for the prevention of financial crime, making sure that the sanctions regimes are being respected, and all of these things. And so using the opportunity to recognize the deficiencies and improve our own sort of infrastructure has been a boon because we're now teed up for the next 10, 20 years of innovation in the space. Um, and we're also sort of on our own journey with the regulator, you know, because there is that that relationship of uh, ebb and flow, or not ebb and flow, but back and forth, to, to kind of mold the future um, of privacy in, in this jurisdiction. Um, I've also seen uh, that there's um, you know, a, a, a recent recognition of the value of personal information and what it needs that it needs the protection, so that investment argument, that you know, the, the, bot, the impact on the bottom line is becoming an increasingly easier argument to make, especially with the advent, and this is a particularly hot topic in Bermuda over the last uh, few years, you know, with the fintech and blockchain and digital currencies. Um, and incidentally, digital currencies is something that we're still tackling on this, uh, on this front in Bermuda within the banking system, uh, there are obviously um, you know, risks associated with that that directly conflict with our own uh, <coughs> regulations, as well as some of our other third party uh, relationships. Um, you know, the, the correspondent banks have to be satisfied that we're doing our due diligence, and uh, there's a number of considerations. And so that I think is probably where we as uh, you know, a financial services institution in Bermuda are finding the next big gap to, to cross with the regulator. And I think you address it quite well on that opening slide, the different tensions. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, those all need some kind of wide-scale resolution before we can really allow this blockchain technology in the next sort of, you know, epoch of, of financial services to really mature. Terrific. So you've actually got a, a tangible working relationship with the Financial Conduct Authority and the Privacy Regulator to help you navigate um, through those changes. One of the themes that keeps coming up, of course, is AML and CFT. Um, and just a, a quick overview, um, as we know, the, the customer relationship is one where you're constantly looking at anti-money laundering. It doesn't just stop as the, at the onboarding piece, which you referred to, where you have to know your customer, but you need to screen transactions to make sure that there's no fraud involved, to identify and to report those, um, to analyze um, your, your customer base, uh, to, to understand where the risks may um, arise, and then, of course, to screen against sanctions. We We've seen a huge upsurge in the number of sanctions, sanctions of legal entities as, as well as sanctions of individuals that financial institutions need to focus on. And some of the privacy challenges that we see arising there are determining what is the basis for processing in that space, usually for an obliged entity, which would be a financial institution or real estate agent or accountancy firm. It's an obligation under law, but many of them are also relying on third parties for risk intelligence databases and for outsourcing services and so on and so forth, and that tends to be legitimate interests. There's also um, the restrictions on the processing of criminal and sensitive data, which are so core to the AML CFT um, process, and then international data transfers, both within an organization, peer-to-peer, -peer, and also public-to-private um, sharing of data. Um, huge issues there. So, Tammy, I wonder if I could um, turn to you, because you've got extensive experience um, in, in that area of, you know, 
potential challenges and frictions between financial services and privacy legislation, AML, CFT, and can you share with us what you found to be the most challenging area? Absolutely. Um, so, I'm, I'm, first of all, I think what you're doing in Dubai is amazing, and I um, uh, wish that we could all do that. Uh, <laughs> the word that keeps coming up is entangled. I think Deirdre used that this morning. Um, there's just this tangle of different, uh, different ideas and different concepts that uh, the AML um, laws want to pr protect and the data, govern or data privacy laws want to protect. Um, so I'll speak from quite a different perspective from the World Bank and MoneyGram. I'm not representing them, but I'll just speak to my experiences there through humanitarian relief as well as serving and addressing the um, financial inclusion problem that we have around the world. So many people are unbanked or underbanked, and there's a very, very uh, real uh, need for services like MoneyGram that provide these peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Many of them are across international borders, um, and they're done on a non-depository uh, basis. So each transaction is individual, meaning every single time somebody uh, uh, uses MoneyGram, there has to be a KYC uh, process done. And um, along with the, the uh, know your customer um, requirements, there's the record keeping. And then on top of that, and Vivian, you touched on this, there's the reporting of suspicious activity. So uh, those three things are, um, I don't want to say in conflict. I want to say there's an opportunity there to make sure that we're doing that with an eye toward uh, protecting and furthering data privacy rights. Um, I'll never forget my, uh, my first week at MoneyGram, and this just illustrates the concept of follow the money and you'll find uh, the crimes. Um, my, it was actually my second day there, and uh, my colleagues were celebrating because they had worked through the night with law enforcement to um, find and, uh, and capture a fugitive who had escaped police custody, who was wanted for murder, and they tracked him through a transaction of $100 from his grandmother to where he was hiding out in another country. So the smallest of transactions can really make a difference. We also see this in humanitarian aid and the use of digital um, identification and digital uh, technology um, done for very, very uh, appropriate reasons, but there it, it's rife with opportunity also for financial crimes and other crimes against humanity. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is at MoneyGram, um, and this is really a boots on the ground um, observation, um, it operates with a network of 350,000 agents all over the world. So those agents are the ones who are taking in um, the identification, matching it to make sure that, yes, this looks like who is presenting it to me, taking in the information on the nature of the transaction, and making that judgment call over, does this seem legitimate? Is this... Uh, something suspicious, and again, it may not have anything to do with the uh, transaction limits. Um, and then they have a question, do I report this if I think that this feels like it's uh, in out of compliance with the AML laws? And then if it does get to MoneyGram, MoneyGram has the same, um, the, the same judgment calls. Do we contact law enforcement? Do we contact um, FinCEN immediately? How do you make those calls? And so I, what I see is blockchain and digitization and central banking are really moving us along. And it, again, it's refreshing to hear that um, colleagues are working with financial regulators as well as data protection because there's such an opportunity to really tie these together and make sure that um, the, the companies on the ground, the organizations who are trying to provide the relief and the, the banking services um, are working in tandem with the law enforcement and regulators to make sure that we're making, making an, uh, a, an effort to stop the, 
the crime that we're seeing. And the crime has real impacts in terms of um, mm -hmm. modern slavery, counterfeiting, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. things that really mm -hmm. touch the consumer personally. And I think it's unfortunate it's called financial crime because actually it's individual crime. It just happens to come through the network of finances which touches everyone. Right. Uh, one of my, uh, my other experiences at MoneyGram did deal with human trafficking and uh, working with the FBI and Interpol to try and um, break up this human trafficking ring that was um, so incredibly sophisticated and heartbreaking. Um, so it really is follow the money. And, and the data, when you pool it, can yeah. give that information and insight um, to actually get on the front foot, rather than waiting for the crime to, mm. to, to happen, is actually to identify the networks and patterns of, of money flow so you can actually cut it off at source. So, anyway, there's so much in that. But, um, Alessandra, I wonder if I could just come back to you because um, there's been a lot of work being done at the Council of Europe level with Convention 108, recent guidelines there on AML and CFT. We're seeing a lot of focus at the EU level on that privacy AML CFT. And, of course, um, some work being done at the European uh, data Protection Board. So could you just share your thoughts on how the privacy requirements can better help support the objectives of AML CFT? Because often the dialogue is around the challenges and the conflict. So t tell us about the positive support side. So thank you, Viviane. Of course, uh, you mentioned different documents are coming from different contexts. So one, the guidelines on AML and data protection, which were adopted by the Consultative Committee of Convention 108 in June 2023, and then the work of the European <coughs> Data Protection Board, also in the in respect of the proliferation of legislation at EU level on AML and CFT. Different contexts, but I would say with the many commonalities, in particular in respect of the need to find a balance balancing uh, between, of course, the data protection uh, rights and the need for ensure efficient uh, AML and CFT policies. I, I think that it, it's quite obvious that uh, operators, um, obliged entities, um, better said, which are called upon to comply with AML and CFT obligations are often pushed to collect and process data, sometimes even redundant data and a sort of just-in-case uh, logic. At the same time, they are also uh, uh, called upon to comply with minimization, necessity, proportionality, with something which obliged them to carefully assess the quantity and quality of data to, to avoid unnecessary processing and undue risks for, for individuals. And against this background, with the at least apparently, let's say, conflicting objectives, uh, I think that policy makers have a crucial role to play to disambiguate and to remove the legal uncertainties, which are not good at all for data subjects, that's for sure, but for obliged entities either. Um, just to give you a more concrete example, what a, a policy maker or a legislator could do uh, in the AML CFT context uh, would be to define with clarity and precision the general condition governing the lawfulness um, of the processing by obliged entities, so which legal basis they could rely on, uh, the type of data which are subject to the processing in this context, the data subjects concerned, um, but also the entities to and the purposes for which personal data may be disclosed, the specification of storage periods which cannot remain undefined, and also the type of personal data which can be uh, provided by third parties. And if I have time, I will go back to that a, a little bit. So I think that with appropriate, clear, and, and foreseeable, to say it with the word of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, legal frameworks, uh, uh, legal certainty is ensured, which is an advantage for operators, uh, for data subject, but also also for efficiency, because for sure efficiency is better achieved as unnecessary personal data are not susceptible only to create unacceptable forms of discrimination. Think about financial exclusion, for example, of, or the practice of the risking, um, which can derive from an imprecise uh, processing, uh, but also to increase errors uh, that really endanger the, the efficiency of the AML and CFT objectives uh, by all actors, including, by the way, law enforcement authorities, uh, for example. 
um, the kind of approach based on, on the need for consideration of data protection at the very moment AML and CFT policy is conceived was, uh, let's say, very much recommended by the ADPB uh, in a letter of May 2021 to the European commissioners uh, which were, who were already engaged in the revision of the AML uh, CFT uh, rules at EU level um, and also in a letter uh, adopted in March 2023 which was about the data sharing you also mentioned before, uh, data sharing among private parties uh, which also raises uh, several concerns in terms of privacy. And the same kind of concern that uh, obliged entities may have a sort of defensive approach and may collect and process more data that are needed were voiced also by the guidelines of the Consultative Committee of Convention 108. You also mentioned where it was really uh, recommended that obliged entities should use a sort of risk-based approach uh, which would allow also for the alignment uh, with the proportionality requirement envisaged under data protection uh, requirements, but also uh, to, let's say, um, impact positively on, uh, on AML uh, and CFT efficiency. Uh, I probably should stop here, I guess. Mm -hmm. so thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're just tight yeah. on time because it's such Sorry. a rich um, topic. But it's, it's been really useful to see um, the engagement now taking place because financial institutions have for too long felt that they are stuck between two regimes that don't necessarily speak to each other or um, meet in the middle in, in, in the, the place that they need to. Um, and I would just, uh, one word for me on that is that while we might solve some of those issues satisfactorily um, on a national level, actually the real key is to sort that out at an international level because financial services always operates on a cross-border basis and actually that's where the solutions need to be found. But I'd love to move to just one more topic which is absolutely key to AML um, CFT. And Karamoko, if I could come to you, there's been a lot of talk in this increasingly digitized economy um, about the importance of digital identity. And there's been lots of attempts um, at digital identity. But are we barking up the wrong tree when we're talking about rolling out centralized digital identity? Or should we be talking more about digital verification? And you're a real expert in this space. Can you, can you just help navigate us through, please? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try. Um, this is a very complex subject with regards to finance and the intersection with technology and data privacy, et cetera. And there have been numerous attempts at implementing digital identity, and there are numerous challenges, numerous challenges. The first one is trust, right? Um, luckily, the financial industry has that trust already with their customers because they have to provide this information, and everything we do is based off of a financial transaction. Um, but with regards to digital identity, with the challenges there, the, you know, dealing with trust and also dealing with interoperability and having to work at an international level as well as at internal and, and within a country, say, for example, within a, you, you know, the United States, there are 50 different states. So interoperability is one of the main challenges. On top of that, you have to have standards for, for interoperability. And the standards for digital identity were built on top of web standards. And those standards were built on top of other standards. So we have standards of standards, which is a challenge because a lot of the folks aren't talking to each other, right? <laughs> um, and then these standards are also novel and how you would need to use that digital identity is novel, which means we would need to move away from how we currently operate, which means new legislative regimes and different buy-ins around the world and how to use digital identity within these different jurisdictions the same way so that I can travel from here to the United States or to Europe and have the same identity and have it recognized and verified for, that, for what I need to be verified for. So if we look at digital identity, digital identity would be used to perform verification of something, right? But if we look at digital verification, do we need digital identity to perform digital verification, right? So we perform verification now through the confines of or through what exists, which is actual credentials. We have passports, driver's license, national identity cards, et cetera. And maybe there needs to be a short, medium, and long-term roadmap where we look at how can we use credentials in the digital form to operate similarly to, what, to how we are operating right now. And that credential can be issued by a government. It could be issued by someone else. But within that credential, we can hold that credential on our person. That credential is a piece of data which has 
with whom we wish to share it with or whom we have shared it with and how long we want to share it with said verifier. So the different actors in the verification process. We have an issuer which issues something to a subject which they hold for verification on their person and then we have the verifier in which I go to somewhere and they need to verify that I am who I am for AML and KYC purposes. Right, so we focus more so in the short term on credentialing then we can actually have verification performed digitally. And in order to perform verification digitally, we also have to perform validation of said credential digitally because we have to confirm its authenticity and whether or not it was actually issued by a party that has the authority to issue said credential. We really need to be careful around how we talk about identity, and how we perform verification because you, know, you have different actors and vendors out now developing the same technology, which is around the use case of identity. They're all going to the same funders to fund them to develop this technology. But we want to make sure identity is you know, democratized. right? We want to make sure everyone can get it and use this identity. And there isn't a situation where we have the under-identified, like we have under-banking right now. So from a standpoint of digital credentials, to wrap it up, um, we can align digital credentials to how, for how we use paper you know, credentials right now. They can be owned by the subject. I can hold it in my digital wallet. And the credential can be used to verify with some party that I am who I am and I have the authority to be able to perform the actions that I need to perform. The credential itself can confirm its authenticity by validating that credential similarly to your passport now and the protection mechanisms built in within said passport. And if I am a party or a subject and I'm verifying with someone, I can actually uh, uh, place in my credential with whom I want to share it with, what I want to share, and when that consent should actually expire. So I think we should kind of bifurcate the discussion around what do we need now and, how, and what's the best path for us to move into a digital world versus trying to reinvent all of it in the short term. And, going through the chicken and the egg scenario where we're still trying to solve a problem around identity when we just need to verify people for things that they need to perform. Thank you. It's such a pragmatic approach and one actually which is highly sympathetic to the privacy principles as well and enables individuals to hold so much more control. Um, Laurie, I'm just going to pass to you quickly. Could you give us some insights um, from a DIFC perspective how you're approaching um, identity verification and also um, UBOs? Um, ultimate yep. Beneficial Ownership Registers. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we um, in DIFC have a few mechanisms in place, one of them being uh, digital verification and sort of having a set uh, certification policy for identity and using digital verification services to kind of enable that pragmatic approach to um, identification of you know, UBOs of any sort of shareholders, stakeholders, what have you, in, in a business setup. Um, the, one of the other things that we do as well is uh, for UBOs in particular, um, we have what we call the vault. And it's something that is kind of a break glass only situation where, you know, information about people, names, it's just lists of names basically go into a completely private, completely um, sort of off the grid kind of um, digital database and um, never the twain shall meet for privacy purposes. We don't want um, to just sort of publish our UBO record. Um, it can be inspected. Every company is supposed to maintain a UBO register and submit it to the registrar or the commissioner, or what have you, um, on an as needed basis. But we try to keep that, uh, maintain that sort of sense of security and privacy for our UBO data not to um, obfuscate uh, or, or create some sort of um, a wall for authorities that are looking for that information or data, but to also be able to respect the privacy of those UBOs. Um, and yes, we'll turn it over if we're meant to turn it over, but um, it's something that we think helps to um, enable a little bit more uh, security around that information. I mean, there's some really uh, quite critical information in, in that database, and we don't want it to be just accessible necessarily to anyone. Uh, there's a lot of debate in the UAE right now, I think, as well, about having a public uh, register 
in, in that regard. We do have a public register as an organization, um, and there is a lot of information listed on it. But if you see, for example, a stakeholder listed on the public register, they could be a UBO, they might not be a UBO, you won't necessarily know, but you, what we, you will know is the important bit, they're a director, they're um, a shareholder, a stakeholder, or what have you. But when it comes to the source of wealth and funds and whatnot in terms of a UBO, that is protected. So it's, you're basically navigating an approach where we need the transparency in order to um, verify um, the ultimate beneficiary ownership yeah. or identity um, in many cases, but nonetheless, we are also able to incorporate the privacy protections. So there's layers of access uh, depending, and, and interestingly, of course, every jurisdiction is approaching this in a slightly different way. Mm. Um, some don't even have a UBO register, some do, and it's openly available, and then some do, but obviously there's restricted access. So we're almost at time, um, because I think our tea break is in two minutes, um, <laughs> but I have a question for um, each of you to wrap up today, um, and you get a choice. Um, so you get to choose. What are you going to answer in one minute, less than <laughs> one minute? Um, what do you think is the most, out, uh, the most significant outstanding challenges that needs to be solved between financial services and privacy today? Or um, what do you think has been the most impactful achievement of the collaboration between financial and privacy regulators today in the context of financial services. I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm going to start with you, Karamoko, because <laughs> right at the end, go for it. Um, listening today about what's generally about to happen or may happen with CDBCs, it's going to be very interesting to see how they they become portable, right? Because currency works offline now, right? And and it's you know, listening to how um, these things are coming to fruition makes me really want to get an understanding of, all right, well, how are they going to work on and offline? Because, yeah. you know, we've been looking at different means of making what we do uh, portable with regards to if you need to verify something, it needs to work on and offline, and we work in an offline world. So how do you prevent double spin, and how do you actually make sure you can verify we don't have an internet connection? Because uh, we live in these great societies, but some societies around the world, they don't have a constant data connection, or they may not have consistent power. So in order to use these particular tools um, and digital currencies, we'll need to be able to solve that problem. So hearing that today lets me know that at least we're already working on it. Fantastic. Thank you. Tammy, how about you? Sure. I think um, to dovetail on, on your comments, I think recognizing that there are millions of people in the world who have no identification at all, and as efforts are underway to help provide that digital identification verification through the use of biometrics and other, um, other enablers, I think there's uh, a great opportunity to meld data privacy, financial services into one and make sure that uh, digital identity is available but also protected and not given in, not enabling to get that into the hands of bad actors. Thank you. Jeff. I'm really interested to see how things will shake out with, uh, so um, you have this, oh, the advent of cryptocurrency and blockchain is tran transformational, and so you have all these intermediaries in the financial ecosystem that at the moment play a vital role in that KYC and that vetting uh, and that guarding the gates of the financial, uh, the financial system. What does that look like post normalization of cryptocurrency? And how do you achieve those public policy initiatives that are currently met or well, attempting to be met through the, the existing framework of AML, CFT, uh, and the like uh, and the, in a post crypto? Uh, world. So I'm really interested to see how that's going to shake out because it's a, it's, I think it's a bit of a stumper. Yes, theory versus practice. Good point. Mm -hmm. Laurie. I'm going to go with the achievement question. Um, and I think it just goes back to the session that we had prior to lunch around regulators learning from and working with each other. And, and my last point that I made, I failed to mention Gibraltar. Hi, Bradley. <laughs> We're also working with um, them and, and reaching out to other regulators as well. But just within the UAE, for an example, um, 
uh, one of the things that the DIC courts has set up is the digital economy court. And the first, one of the first things that the consultants working on that did was reach out to me to say, who are the privacy experts that we need to weigh in on this particular um, setup? So, you know, recognizing that we're not operating in silos and we shouldn't, there's a lot of issues that have to be covered and we're, we're working across uh, regulatory boundaries, if you will, to limit those boundaries and, and remove them. Fantastic. I love the, the focus on the digital economy because I think that's really where we need to be is that much yeah. more holistic approach. Alessandra. So both questions, but in one minute, I promise. Oh, you're both. <laughs> um, well, I believe that the most relevant challenge is still to find appropriate space and time uh, for a dialogue between supervisor authorities and financial institutions. That's for sure. It can be very challenging, can, can be very much in the hands of the data protection authorities to solicit it, that uh, to encourage that kind of dialogue, also engaging in a technical conversation to orient the, the core choices of the, the financial sector in a privacy-friendly way. Um, I have spoken before about the positive cooperation which took place at the European Union level between the European Data Protection Board and, let's say, the, the um, uh, European Commission, but I believe that an equally positive example was also the guidelines that you also mentioned the, on AML and CFT at the Council of Europe level, because they were adopted after a, an extensive consultation of, of different actors, uh, including, for example, the Financial Action Task Force the Secretariat, uh, and the Committee of Experts on Anti-Money Laundering and, and uh, CFT at the Council of Europe, the so-called Moneyball. And I think that uh, the mutual understanding of the, of the different interests at stake really uh, created a virtuous reasoning uh, on that occasion that made us understand that uh, privacy is definitely also a tool for the achievement of our better EML and CFT policies. Thank Super. you. Thank you very much. So thank you to everyone here um, for your uh, interest in attendance and also a huge thank you to our speakers. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, I think what we do know is that the financial services sector continues to evolve in an innovative way in the digital economy faster potentially than many other sectors. Um, we are making some headway in terms of that, um, seeing it much more holistically, the collaboration cooperation between financial services regulators and privacy regulators so that the financial institutions institutions and the financial services infrastructure, uh, the broader piece, um, have a lot more certainty and are able to incorporate privacy into the financial services obligations in a seamless way. But the pace of innovation and the nature of innovation is giving rise to some very significant challenges. And we're seeing that particularly with digital currencies, with digital assets, with digital identity. And we need to be much more creative in terms of how we regulate that within the current constructs of both privacy and financial services regulation so that we can achieve the outcomes um, of trust and certainty that we're actually seeking. So thank you very much for introducing some of these key concepts to us. Um, we've made some great headway, but there's still a lot to do. Um, but I think the future ahead is bright. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.